so we can start. Uh, so today we have a new uh, lecturer who just arrived, uh, Henry Cohn. Um, he will give two lectures, one today and one tomorrow. And okay, he's a, um, a researcher at Microsoft in, in Cambridge, uh, uh, and, and he's also a professor at, at MIT in the Department of Mathematics. Uh, okay, so he's going to talk about packing problems. So you have, you have probably used in, uh, in physics and in software to pack objects in two and three dimensions. But the backing problem is also very important if you generalize it to arbitrary dimensions, in particular in large dimensions in mathematics, it's a very important problem. Harry is a big expert on that, yeah, I think he's going to talk a little bit about that. And um, so what else? I guess that's it. So uh, as, uh, as usual, feel free to interact and ask questions. And Thanks. So can everyone hear me? I don't know whether this is just recording it for video or whether this is amplifying it. Okay, great. So let me emphasize, please be sure to ask questions. I know that first of all, this is a fairly diverse audience with people from a lot of different backgrounds. And secondly, it's an audience that's very different from my background. And so that's all the more reason why you should ask questions, ask clarifying questions about anything that's unclear to you, ask tangential questions just for fun, ask whatever you'd like. Basically, I'd like this to be interactive. If it's not interactive, there's not a lot of point to it because everything I'm going to be telling you, except maybe in response to questions, is stuff that's all written down somewhere. In particular, uh, I've got notes from PCMI, the Park City uh, Mathematics Institute from 2014. Uh, you can find them on the archive. Uh, it's one of, I put them on the archive last spring. Uh, let me know if you have any trouble finding them and I'll look up what the archive idea is. But basically, if you want a written reference, that will tell you everything that uh, I'm planning to tell you. And in particular, this means that the only advantage of doing this live as opposed to simply having you read it is the interaction. So please take advantage of that. Okay. So what are we going to be talking about? So I guess the overall title was something like mathematical packing problems. We're going to be focusing primarily on the spear packing problem. So here the idea is we're going to have a bunch of identical perfect spheres. So this is obviously not super realistic for any sort of physical applications. On the other hand, you can think of this as basically the simplest non-trivial packing problem you can look at. There are some packing problems that are pretty stupid like packing cubes, duh, you can tile space with cubes. That's not very interesting. But spheres are basically the simplest problem that's really mathematically deep. And looking at this idealized scenario, it's sort of a powerful mathematical test case. If we can't even understand how to pack uh, identical perfect spheres, then we're never going to understand how to pack weird things like tetrahedra. So here, uh, the problem is not that exciting about low dimensions. So the key thing we're going to be doing is looking at this in arbitrary dimensions. And I'll say a little bit more later today about why we should care about this. Part of why I love this problem is sphere packing in high dimensions sounds at first like the least practical thing anyone's ever thought of. That if you went back in time to someone in the 19th century and said, hi, I'm a researcher from the future. I study spear packing in thousands of dimensions. I mean, aside from the researcher from the future part, they would have thought that even the thousands of dimensions part sounded crazy. On the other hand, it turns out that high dimensions actually have real practical applications in information theory. So basically what I want to do today is talk with you about this problem in general. What are some of the phenomena that occur? How do spheres pack in high dimensions? What do we know? What do we don't know? And overall, why do we care? Why does this problem matter for the world? So let me say exactly what we're doing. So what we're trying to do is to maximize the packing density. In other words, the density, remember, here is just going to be the fraction of space covered.
by the spheres. So we're going to have a bunch of spheres. They can be tangent, but they're not allowed to overlap. And we want to cover as much of space as possible. So we're cramming in as many spheres as we can. I hope I don't destroy the boards. OK, so what does this look like? So in low dimensions, we all know how this works. So for example, in two dimensions, it's pretty obvious what you do. You take a sphere, you start surrounding it by tangent neighbors, and modulo my poor drawing exactly six should fit around. And this pattern uh, extends one, two, three making sure I'm not drawing it wildly unrealistically. This pattern extends to a packing of all of space, and this is pretty obviously optimal. And even here, the mathematics is a little bit tricky. It's not obvious how to prove that this is optimal. On the other hand, it's a true fact. Uh, a mathematician named Tue proved this in 1892, and this is indeed the optimal packing. Yes? Oh, yes. So what do I mean by spheres? Uh, excellent question. So remember, in three dimensions, spheres are just all the things that affect distance from the center. And uh, we'll do the same thing in any dimension. So two-dimensional spheres are disks. One-dimensional spheres are intervals. Four-dimensional spheres are a little bit hard to visualize, but they exist at least abstractly. that answer your question? Anything else? Excuse me? So, so it's like all the like maximum density for all the packing. E exactly. So w we want to look at each fixed dimension and maximize the packing density. So for example, this is the densest packing in two dimensions out of all the possible ways of arranging non-overlapping -over disks. Yes? Is there a reason you're using identical um, spheres and not like several sizes? Yes and no. So one reason is just simplicity. We can't even do this very well. Another reason is for the information theoretic uh, applications, the identical spheres will be very relevant. But you're right that there's no reason we should limit ourselves to this, that some sort of you know, polydispersed packings with all sorts of different sizes uh, would make a lot more sense for real materials. Think of this as sort of a toy model. Yes? Is the order packing the max the optimal in every dimension? That's a very good question. The answer is nobody knows. And uh, I'll get more back to this later, but basically our knowledge falls off precipitously in high dimensions, and we can't even answer very basic questions like do we expect packings to be ordered or disordered? So it's a deep question. Unfortunately, I don't have a For deep answer. We know. Excuse me? For the dimensions we have solved it. Yeah, so the only dimensions we've solved that are 1, 2, 3, 8, and 24, where they're all highly ordered. But in general, <laughs> this could just be a coincidence. Yes? I was just going to ask, so oh. once you understand it for the mm -hmm. spheres, can you also make a deformation and then therefore know it for ellipses or ellipsoids? Or if you can deform this, if your ellipso ellipsoids are all required to be aligned with each other. So if, they're all, if all the axes have to be aligned, then it's just a deformation of sphere packing. On the other hand, if you're allowed to sort of align them arbitrarily, then it's a much more subtle problem. Definitely, yep. So for example, in three dimensions, uh, ellipsoids can pack better than spheres if you don't align them all. Did you have a question? Yeah, I'm assuming we're doing like Exactly. So I've been a little bit sloppy about what I mean by the sort of fraction of space covered. So it, it means exactly what you're suggesting. I mean, one thing you can do is look at a sort of large chunk of space and sort of let the boundaries recede to infinity with free boundary conditions. Or you can look at it in a big torus and make the torus bigger and bigger. And if you're a mathematician, you might sort of worry a little bit about, is this well-defined? Do these different definitions give the same answer? Or do there exist optimal packings with good properties? The answer to all of this is yes, but I'm assuming this is a little bit sort of outside the interests of most of the audience. But uh, basically, the answer is you're totally right that you have to think about things like this. No matter how you do it, in any reasonable way, you get the right answer, and it all works out. Did you have a question? 
That's a good question. Uh, so uh, exactly drawing a sort of boundary between order and disorder, I don't know how to do it. So you can look at sort of periodic packings. Those are going to be definitely ordered. And you can look at random packings. Those are going to be disordered. And exactly where you draw the line in between these, I don't know. So even this question of are high dimensional packings ordered or disordered, I don't even know how to formulate it precisely. I can formulate several versions, but it's not clear it's sort of the ultimate one. Yes? Yep, that would be a reasonable uh, way to look at it, and nobody knows. Is there yeah. something that that definition might miss? Is there a reason why it's the obvious definition and not the right one? So I th really like yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions, comments? Okay, so we understand two dimensions pretty well, and the reason why this was proved in the 19th century is because here uh, we don't have any geometrical frustration. I mean, frustration here would mean that what spheres want to do locally is different from what they want to do globally, and that doesn't happen here. If you imagine trying to cram things in as densely as possible, if you look around any given desk, the best thing you can do is sort of cram in the six neighbors. And we get really lucky that the best thing they want to do locally extends to a wonderful global packing, and we never sort of box ourselves into a corner by sort of over-optimizing it locally in a way that messes things up globally. Unfortunately, three dimensions behaves very differently. So what do we do in R3? So in R3, this problem has, it became known as the Kepler conjecture. The thing is that uh, the Kepler conjecture said that uh, the densest packing was the sort of obvious one. If you go to the grocery store and look how they stack oranges, or if you go to a war memorial and look how they stack cannonballs, they're doing it in the densest possible way, unless you find the world's worst grocer or something. <laughs> and... Uh, this is called the Kepler conjecture, despite the fact that Kepler basically doesn't deserve any credit for it. That what happened is a scientist named Thomas Harriot, uh, who really ought to be better known, he did a lot of interesting things, but didn't publish enough and isn't that famous. Uh, he wrote to Kepler sort of suggesting the packing problem and that maybe it's relevant to the atomic structure of matter and that maybe the sort of obvious three-dimensional packing is the best one. And uh, then Kepler wrote to his friends and said, hey, I've been thinking about packing problems. <laughs> and uh, Kepler ended up getting uh, a lot more credit for this historically than he deserves. Anyway, so what did this say? One way of thinking about it is the best way to do this is to stack optimal two-dimensional layers. So you take a hexagonal layer, you stack another hexagonal layer on top of it, etc. But when you stack them on top, you don't just put a sphere directly on top of this sphere. You sort of nestle the spheres into the gaps so the packing layers sink a little bit closer together. So let's look at how this works. So I'm going to draw purple for the centers of these spheres. So I'm going to use yellow for the next layer. So here there's a gap between these three. So I'm going to put a sphere here. And now I'm not going to put another sphere in this gap. The problem is this gap is too close to that one. The spheres would overlap. This one's far enough away, though. And I'm going to put one here. I'm going to put one here. So if I do it like this, these uh, yellow points are going to form another hexagonal layer nicely nestled into the gaps in the previous layer. On the other hand, we're only going to fill up half of the gaps. If you look at these red gaps also, the red gaps are not being used in this next layer. On the other hand, there's nothing sacred about the yellow ones. I could have chosen the red ones instead, and that would have given a, slightly, a sort of slightly offset layer. 
And so in general, whenever we stack a layer, we've got two choices. In each layer, when we stack the next one in, we've got twice as many gaps as we're able to fill with the next layer. So you've got a choice. Do we put it here or do we put it here? So basically, you've got a ton of different uh, sphere packings. These are typically called Barlow packings because uh, a mathematician named Barlow uh, classified them in the late 19th century. So, for example, the face-centered cubic is one of these. The hexagonal close packing is one of them. But there were infinitely many others also. So the thing is, you've got a binary choice every time you do a layer. And there's nothing that says you even have to do this periodically. The thing is, you could flip a coin each time you go up in a layer in order to get a random choice and get something that's not even periodic. Don't they call this RCP? Uh, random close packing? or I think random close packing is typically not quite as structured as this, but some sort of you know compress or random packing or something like that. So it's typically not, so I think random close packing is typically not actually an optimal packing. By the way, if I misuse terms from physics or material science, please let me know. Okay, so one thing we can see here is the three-dimensional problem is considerably more subtle. The answer isn't even remotely unique. And there's one sense in which the answer is never unique. The thing is, talking about uniqueness for sphere packings, it turns out is pretty annoying because some obnoxious person could come across and could come along and just remove one sphere from your packing and then say, oh, look, it's a different packing. I removed a sphere. But on a global scale, the density didn't change. Ta-da, it's not unique. And that's true in a mathematical sense, but it's not that interesting. A much more interesting example is this one, where the sort of geometry of how you decide uh, which uh, choice to make when adding each layer gives you a lot of flexibility that's really sort of deeply embedded in this problem rather than some stupid thing like removing a sphere. Yes? So for no what? You, so you're totally right that for what for one particular transition it doesn't matter. The thing is that if you take one layer here and then move to the yellow, then you could just shift everything over or maybe rotate it here in order to get to the red. And because there are no boundary conditions, it doesn't matter. So you're right that one individual transition uh, is fine. On the other hand, when you start stacking a bunch of them, then it matters. So one way of looking at it is you've got these three classes here, the purple, red, and yellow. So one thing you could do is just sort of go back and forth, purple, yellow, purple, yellow, purple, yellow. Another thing you could do is cycle between them. And it turns out that these are not uh, actually uh, geometrically equivalent. Yes? Yep, all these have the same density. The thing is, no matter which uh, option you choose, the layers are sort of equally close together. So on a global scale, all these have the same density. Yes? It's surprising that, I mean, it seems like the 3D is pretty trivial. Or yep. Okay. Oh, proving it or? Okay, I don't oh, know. So, <laughs> yeah, describing it is pretty <laughs> trivial. Proving it is actually really difficult. So it was an unsolved problem for a long time until Hales proved it in 1998 by a massive <coughs> computer calculation combined with hundreds of pages of human reasoning. And it was sort of nightmare proof to check. A team of a dozen referees spent years working on it before giving up on the refereeing process and basically declaring that the proof looked right. They'd checked a lot of parts of it in detail. They hadn't found any mistakes, but they just didn't have the time or energy to verify everything. And this was not really satisfactory. So uh, what happened is Hales organized a team of people 
to work out a proof at the level of formal logic that could be checked by machine. And 16 years later, they completed the proof. And now we can say, yes, it is definitely absolutely correct, uh, no doubt about it. On the other hand, it's not a, uh, it's not a very satisfying or illuminating proof. It's not the sort of aha moment where you say, oh, I get it. This is why this must be optimal. And part of the problem is, I said, uh, in two dimensions, there was no frustration. On the other hand, there's tremendous frustration here, both in the sort of psychological sense and in the physical <laughs> sense. That here's the problem. In two dimensions, everything wanted to behave locally exactly the way it should globally. And so, in fact, you can use this to give a proof. What you can do is you can look at the so-called Voronoi cells, uh, where you look at the points that are closer to any sphere center than to, to any given sphere center than to any of the others. And you can prove that uh, the hexagonal packing like this minimizes the area of the Voronoi cell. And you can do this by a purely local calculation that only takes into account a finite number of spheres at once. And then that implies global optimality. So basically, the fact that there's no local frustration here is what enables you to give a sort of short, humanly understandable proof. The problem is, in three dimensions, it just doesn't work. The thing is, if you imagine surrounding a sphere by other spheres, it's not even obvious how many neighbors you can have. It turns out 12 is the maximum number of neighbors, although that's not so clear how to prove. People have proved it, but it takes some work. So what did the sort of 12 spheres want to do? If you think about how to arrange the 12 neighbors as sort of near as possible, maybe minimizing Voronoi cell volume, don't worry about this, this is just a tangential comment. But it turns out the best way to arrange the 12 neighbors in some local sense is a regular dodecahedron. And this makes a lot of sense because uh, that's a very sort of beautiful symmetrical way of doing it. The problem is regular dodecahedra don't tile space. If you look at the face center cubic, that's something called a, that has cells called rhombic dodecahedra. Uh, again, don't worry if you don't quite know, remember offhand what a rhombic dodecahedron is. It's very beautiful, just not quite as regular as a regular dodecahedron. So the problem is, locally, in the three-dimensional problem, the spheres want to do something that does not extend to a global packing. So the problem is, if you make it too good locally, you screw yourself up in the rest of space. And that makes it really hard to prove. The thing is, here, with the local calculations in two dimensions, we got very lucky that we could sort of put blinders on and say, I'm only going to look at things really near one particular sphere, and I'm going to optimize that sort of finite problem. The problem is in three dimensions, you don't even get the right answer if you try to do that. So basically what Hales did was he said, okay, you're not just optimizing the location of the nearest neighbors. What if you go out several layers beyond that? If you go out two or three layers, are you optimizing something there? And then the question is, what are you optimizing? And he came up with a sort of clever proposal that involved weighted averages of volumes of different cells. And it turned out it worked. On the other hand, it's a really horrific optimization problem. Yes? But if you were in curved space, then yep. then uh, the tiling with the dodecahedrons would work, right? Exactly. So there is actually a uh, tiling uh, on the sphere in four dimensions uh, where you actually can tile it with this, and it does work. Uh -huh. Yep. So there are cases like that where you can actually prove optimality. Uh -huh. Because then yep. locally, there's no frustration. Exactly. Yep. Uh, yes. Quick question about... Uh, thickness of the layer. So yep. you have like these layers of like uh, purple uh, crystals and then yep. the yellow ones and then purple again. What mm -hmm. would be the distance between well, one purple layer to the next purple layer? I don't remember the number. It's something like 2 over the square root of 3. But basically what you do is you have a triangle here. You complete it to a tetrahedron by sort of nestling it in right that gap. And then whatever, you compute it in terms of the height of the tetrahedron. So I don't remember the number offhand, but something involving square root of 3. But if you do it regular, it's a cubic lattice, right? Yes. I mean, so, it's, so it's symmetric. It's the same distance as this distance. Exactly. Yep. 
It just pays them a cubic if you do it regularly. Yep, exactly. Incidentally, another thing is if you go to the grocery store, you'll find some things packed with a hexagonal base and some things packed with a square base. And a really good exercise, if you want to understand three-dimensional packings, is go to the grocery store, look at how all the fruit is stacked, and rotate your head appropriately to convince yourself that they're all stacked the same way. Question? So you said that we know the densest packing is 8 and 24 dimensions yes. as well. Is that because there's a lack of frustration in those dimensions compared to No, it's because of an inexplicable miracle. Oh. Uh, I'll say more about this tomorrow, but there probably isn't any frustration in 8 and 24 dimensions, but we don't actually know. Uh, a weird shortcut happens that still needs a better explanation. So what do we know? So we know one, two, and three dimensions. I didn't tell you about one dimension, but that's because it's stupid. One dimensional spheres are intervals. The interval packing problem on the line is you can cover it completely. So uh, we also know eight and 24 dimensions. These are both last year. Uh, a Ukrainian mathematician, Marina Vyazovska, proved eight dimensions. I'll tell you at least briefly about how her proof worked uh, tomorrow. And then uh, Abhinav Kumar, Steve Miller, Danilo Radchenko, uh, Vyazovska, and I uh, extended this to 24 dimensions. So this probably looks pretty weird. The thing is that we've got these gaps. We don't know at a mathematical level with rigorous proofs, the densest packings in four, five, six, or seven dimensions, or in nine through 23, but somehow we know eight and 24. So this is a very weird situation. Yes? What's the next one after 24 that's going to get done? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, if I had to guess, I'd guess the next one that people do is four dimensions but this is sheer speculation. Right now, the techniques we know, basically, the two-dimensional proof is really special to two dimensions. The three-dimensional proof, you might be able to soup it up to higher dimensions, but it's probably beyond the capability of humans and computers in this century. And uh, the eight and 24-dimensional ones are sort of miracles that probably don't work anywhere else. Pretty much, yeah. And uh, so basically, I'll say more about this tomorrow, but the sort of one sentence version of the miracle is it turns out the pair correlation function in these dimensions encodes a ridiculous amount of information that it just doesn't tell you in other dimensions. And I cannot explain why. I mean, I could give you a proof if we had more time, but on the other hand, I have nothing to say about, for example, why 8 and 24 are great and 16 is not. Math just doesn't like 16 as much as 8 or 24, as far as I can tell. Yes? Can you also like, give a little bit of sense of just psychologically, how, how does it, so let's say you try three and it's really difficult, and yep. like all this team, these big teams are working to try to do can do four, can do five, what makes you say, oh, maybe 24 will work? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's a really good question. So let me tell. So l let me take a step back, but we'll get back to this in just a second. So what do we know in high dimensions? So basically, in high dimensions, we know embarrassingly little about what sphere packing is look like. The thing is, I'll make this precise a little bit later today, but it's sort of a humiliation for humanity that such a simple problem seems to be a beyond our abilities. So basically, in general dimensions, uh, what do we know? So we've got some upper bounds saying that you can't achieve density more than such and such. A, an obvious upper bound is one. You can't achieve perfect packings. But on the other hand, you can't even get close to that. And we've got lower bounds guaranteeing that packing is exist with certain density. And these are nowhere near each other in general. In fact, uh, the ratio between these uh, grows uh, exponentially. So let me find a number. Um, 
So for example, in 36 dimensions, which on a scale from one to infinity is not that high, in 36 dimensions, the best bounds we have differ by a multiplicative factor of 58. So all we can prove in 36 dimensions is if you take the best packing anyone knows, if you remove the spheres, you can't stuff in any more than 58 times as many as you took out. And that's really pathetic. So when I first heard this, I thought there's obviously a mistake. How can it be growing exponentially? Doesn't that mean that the optimal density had better be tending to zero? Well, first of all, the answer is yes. Spheres don't pack very well in high dimensions. I'll say a little bit about more about how spheres compare with cubes later, but spheres just aren't good at packing. So why exponentially? So here's one way of thinking about it. Imagine that you have a packing. This is not meant to be any particular packing. And imagine that you take all the distances and increase the distances by 1%. So you don't know you're packing very well. You got a little bit of inaccuracy. Everything is now 1% further than you thought it was supposed to be. So what happens if you increase all the distances by 1%? So remember, volume scales like the nth power. So if you increase everything by a factor of 1.01, the volume changes by a factor of 1.01 to the nth power. So what happens is the density uh, decreases by a factor of 1.01 to the nth, which grows exponentially as a function of n. So basically, the reason why you get the exponential growth here is even a sort of small inaccuracy in the distances gives you an exponential penalty in the volume and therefore an exponential penalty in the density. So basically, it's a scaling phenomenon. But on the other hand, the net result here is high dimensions are weird and hard to wrap your mind around. So in general, you might think that this gap is basically the fault of mathematicians, that maybe, you know, it's like three dimensions where we all know what to do. Nobody's ever been sitting there at a war memorial saying, how should I stack the pet cannonballs in order to make as large and impressive a display as possible? Actually, I take it back. It has happened once. I mentioned Thomas Harriet, who had written to Kepler. So Harriet got interested in this problem because he was consulting for the British Navy. And Sir Walter Raleigh had asked him to draw up a table for the use of ships in the Navy, showing how many cannonballs were in a pile uh, if you measured how many were on, along the base, and if the base was square or triangular. So sadly enough, the problem actually came out of the military industrial complex. But in any case, uh, in any case, uh, the answer is obvious in three dimensions. It turns out the answer is totally non-obvious. So what happens is, first of all, every dimension behaves a little bit differently. What you might expect is that you would find the one true way of packing spheres, and you would, you know, take a generalized face-centered cubic, it would just work in every dimension, and you would know the answer at the physics level. You might not be able to prove it as a mathematician, but as a physicist, you wouldn't care because the answer would be clear. It turns out that's totally not how it works, that each dimension has its own idiosyncrasies, that if you understand eight dimensions, it really doesn't even tell you how to pack in 10 dimensions, say. Yes? Nope, the thing is, this is not a mathematical theorem in any sense currently. It's just sort of uh, an empirical observation. Yes? Is the densest packing in, say, d plus one dimensions bounded by the previous dimension? So you can bound it in terms of it uh, with a sort of loose bound, but things are more complicated than you think. So, for, well, not you personally, but <laughs> one thinks. Uh, so, for example, you can't uh, get optimal packings by stacking in general. 
So the first thing everybody thinks after looking at going from two to three dimensions is, well, duh, you just stack the previous dimension. Even one to two dimensions, you can think of the horizontal lines here as optimal one-dimensional packings that you're stacking nestled together. Then to go from two to three, you stack these. So, okay, so what happens? Well, to go from three to four, you stack three-dimensional layers. It's a little bit more complicated. You have to think about, wait, now there are infinitely many possible layers you could stack, but you can work out the possibilities. And it turns out life is simple. The thing is, if you look at sort of the analog of Barlow packings in four dimensions, there's only one that works. So you might think life's getting more complicated. It actually simplifies in four dimensions. There's a unique way to stack these that's as dense as possible. So, okay, you can stack to go from four to five. You can stack to go from five to six. You can stack from six to seven, seven to eight. And in each case, this gives the densest packings anyone knows. Now, whether they're unique or not varies sort of weirdly from dimension to dimension. The unique in four dimensions, the unique in eight dimensions, they're not unique in three, five, six, or seven dimensions. You can classify them. As far as anyone knows, they're the densest possible. Yes? Yep. So as a physicist, I would love to plot a like, log, log linear plot of these yes. numbers. Do they fall on the same straight line? Yes. So uh, it turns out if you plot the best packings anyone knows, uh, make, say, a log plot of it, they jiggle around a lot. And it kind of looks like it's sort of asymptotic to a line, but it's hard to extrapolate what the slope of the line is. And the data is just less regular than you would expect. So I, I can give you data and plots and stuff if you're interested in taking a look at it. Uh, I'd love to extract more information from this. Yes? How does, how does the stacked uh, packing compare to the optimal packing in, in the eight dimensions that was recently found? Yeah, so you get up to exactly this packing. So basically stacking works up to three dimensions. It probably works in four through seven, although we can't prove it. And the stacking is optimal in eight dimensions. So that might seem weird. Is it possible that you stacked in a suboptimal way but hit optimality again? The answer is yes. So here's the thing. You can keep on stacking that uh, going from one dimension to the next by nestling the layers together. It's a little bit tricky. You have to do some geometric calculations, but it's not really hard. And you can keep on going. And by the time you hit 10 dimensions, it's definitely not optimal. You can think of different packings that aren't stacked at all that totally beat any of the stackings, any of the sort of recursive stackings. So basically, somewhere in nine or 10 dimensions, if not before, this breaks down and stacking doesn't work. And as far as we can tell, stacking basically is a sort of terrible to at best mediocre way of getting packings in high dimensions. It just happens to work beautifully in low dimensions. Yeah. So let me say one thing about 24. So if you keep on stacking, if you're feeling sort of, uh, optimistic and you say, okay, we screwed up 10 dimensions, we screwed up 11 dimensions, we screwed up 12 dimensions, we screwed up 13 and 14 dimensions. Let's just keep on stacking and see if it someday gets good. You hit 24 dimensions and you hit the optimal uh, packing in 24 dimensions. So you can reach the optimal 24 dimensional packing by stacking despite the fact that you definitely screw up in between because what you get in between around you know 10 to 14 dimensions is definitely not optimal it is what it is though and so 24 so the sort of hypothesis that maybe eight could be optimal even if four through seven aren't i don't think it's true i think four through seven really are optimal but it does happen in 24 yes uh i'm Maybe it's obvious, but how, how do we know that the, the stackings aren't optimal? Uh, we find something that beats them. And so how you find something that beats them is kind of weird. So part of the question here, one thing I would like to sort of popularize among you in the audience is where do packings come from? So if you look in the literature, packings typically come from one of three sources. One is 
people being clever, that somebody says, oh, here's a nice symmetry in eight dimensions. I wonder whether there's a good packing that has this symmetry. And they mess around and they find a packing with some symmetry and it turns out to be really good. But on the other hand, this is clearly in no sense an unbiased search. It's sort of heavily biased towards things people can think of. And then people have done numerical searches, just sort of trying, you know, various numerical optimization algorithms to try to find good packings. And people have also tried sort of random ensembles of various sorts. But basically, mathematicians don't have enough good ideas for where packings come from. And in particular, mathematicians are not really the world's experts on how you stick things into space. And so, I hope some of you will sort of take up this problem, play around with it, see what you can find, because basically the world is stuck on things that there might be relatively simple ways to make progress on that we just haven't found yet. So basically, I hope that you sit here looking at this thinking, gee, these mathematicians don't know very much about some of these things. I bet I could make some progress rather than throwing up your hands and saying, it's hopeless, I can't visualize 17 dimensions because nobody can visualize 17 dimensions. Okay, any questions about anything so far? Yes. yes. Yes, so you can certainly get better densities if you allow spheres of different sizes. So for example, one thing you could do is take a bunch of big spheres and make an optimal sphere packing, and then take smaller spheres and start filling in the gaps. So you can definitely increase the density in if you're willing to use uh, enough different sizes with enough ratios. And uh, on the other hand, the problem gets a lot harder. The thing is, in some cases, you can guess the answer because you happen to choose two radii where one fits beautifully into the gaps in the other or something. But if somebody just gives you two random radii, or worse yet, more than two, I don't think anybody has any clue what happens in high dimensions. Yes? Is there any like Kepler conjecture for binary size, for binary spheres? Uh, and provide first spheres in three dimensions? There's nothing quite as famous as that, but there are definitely some conjectures about particular radii. I would have to look it up to be sure, but I believe, for example, uh, if you take, uh, say, the face center cubic and then take smaller spheres that exactly fit into the gaps, that that's certainly believed to be optimal but not proved. Okay, so... I want to say two things uh, before we move on a little bit more to what packings actually look like. So first of all, I want to say something about why we care. So there were a bunch of reasons. Partly there's the sort of mountain climbing reason because it's there, because you know the question of how do you sort of pack spheres into space is a really simple fundamental question that we ought to know the answer to. Another reason is the sort of toy model one that if you care about granular materials, this is the simplest case. But really the reason why most practical people care about this is uh, it turns out sphere packings can be viewed as error correcting codes. So let me tell you what that means. So let's imagine you've got a communication channel. So there are a lot of channels in the world. There are sort of discrete channels like the internet where you're sending, you know, sequences of bits. There are also things that are better modeled as continuous communication channels. So we're going to assume that uh, this is something like you're sending a radio signal. Where your radio signal at a fundamental level is not bits. Uh, instead, uh, you're measuring sort of physical radio signals using real numbers. So I'm going to describe something that's slightly simplified, but it'll get at the sort of gist of what's going on. So we're going to imagine that our channel is modeled by n-dimensional space. So we'll call this signal space. 
So the idea is, in any given transmission, what you're sending is you're sending an n-dimensional vector. And what that just means is you're sending something described by n measurements. So for example, if you're sending a radio signal, you might be measuring you know, the amplitude at n different frequencies or something like that. In any case, you're sending a signal that's described by n numbers. And uh, you know, there are all sorts of things that you want to think about if you're doing things practically. Probably only some portion of the actual signal space is available for use, but whatever. You have a question? Yeah, do you mean n are the carrier frequencies like different n stations, but then you, you still have some bandwidth around each carrier? Oh, I'm, I'm imagining that each of the, that these are just, um, you don't even have to think about a specific sort of realistic model for radio, just anything where you have n measurements. So the signal that you're sending is just described by a vector of n measurements of some sort. Uh, sounds like that doesn't answer your question. Or well, yeah, I'm trying to yeah. visualize what the n numbers at any instant in time. Exactly. So you're going to send a stream of signals. So you're going to send a signal, let's say another signal, uh, one at a time, each one described by a vector of length n. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the big problem in communication theory is noise. So uh, there would be no interesting theory here if there weren't noise. If all of our messages were received perfectly, then uh, we'd be done. The problem is all real world channels are noisy. When you send a message, the received signal is never exactly the same as what you sent. Instead, it's going to be some perturbed version of it. So what happens? So the idea is we're going to send some signal, let's call it little s. So we'll draw it here in signal space. On the other hand, uh, the problem is that uh, when we receive a version of this R, you're typically going to receive something that's nearby to S, but not quite equal to it. So here, uh, the problem is that uh, everything gets distorted a little bit in transmission. So what we're going to assume is that the distance from R to S is bounded by some number epsilon that's going to measure the noise level. So here the idea is we're going to imagine that the signal that we send is surrounded by a sphere of radius epsilon. And that's measuring sort of how much distortion can occur. And whatever gets received is, with very high probability, going to be within this sphere. So this is obviously, in some sense, a simplified model. You could say, you know, isn't the saying that the noise distribution is rotationally symmetric? And that's not actually such a bad assumption. If you think about this in terms of probability theory, if you've got a sufficiently complicated high dimensional channel, you're probably going to have Gaussian noise. If you think about the level sets of a Gaussian, of a normal distribution, the level sets are going to be aligned ellipsoids. And we can rescale the coordinate system to make the level sets circles. So the sort of circular symmetry here is indeed sort of a special case, but it's a special case that's in some sense generic that happens uh, by default uh, up to scaling in most channels. Yes? I just, but that feels like a, it's a soft sphere problem, not a hard sphere problem. Exactly. So here, one thing we're doing is turning this into a hard problem by just sort of setting a cutoff and uh, saying we want to achieve zero error as long as everything stays within these. You're right that a more refined analysis would view this as sort of a soft problem with some potential function that allows a little bit of overlap, but not too much. So it turns out, so I'll describe the sort of simplest case here. There's sort of an infinite number of complications. 
you can sort of look at sort of adding sort of soft decision information to this. You can look at more realistic noise models. So for example, if you're looking at something like cell phones, your noise model should take into account interference from nearby transmitters. It should take into account <coughs> reflections off buildings. Basically, there are uh, a limitless number of ways to make this more elaborate and in many cases more realistic. It'll turn out the same basic geometry governs it though. Excuse me? Like a Gaussian or something like that, a normal distribution, where here you're measuring how likely it is to go out to a certain distance. Yes? Exactly. So, uh, so co basically, computer scientists tend to think about discrete signals. Electrical engineers tend to think about uh, continuous signals. The electrical engineers sort of <coughs> argue that their view is superior because all of the discrete signals get sent by continuous channels anyway. On the other hand, basically, there are disciplinary differences in how this is approached. This sort of discrete version turns out to have exactly the same geometry, but over a finite field in a sort of discrete setting. I like the continuous version, but it's at least applicable to a lot of sort of physical channels. So there's a version of all these problems for discrete. Exactly, yep. Okay, so, so how does this work? So the idea is each possible signal you can send is surrounded by uh, a little error ball. And the problem is overlap. So here the issue is, imagine two signals, S1 and S2, where the error spheres overlap. If we receive something in the overlap of these spheres, then based on our assumptions so far, we really don't know whether it came from S1 or S2. So what are we going to do to deal with this? So, uh, Claude Shannon, in his sort of fundamental paper on information theory in 1948, proposed using an error correcting code. So by an error correcting code, what this means is we're going to restrict our attention to some set of possible signals for which the error spheres don't overlap. So basically, to minimize, to eliminate ambiguity, we're going to agree ahead of time, here are the only signals that we're possibly going to send. So for example, if we have a two-dimensional channel, we might all agree that these purple signals are the only ones we're ever actually going to send. And then whenever we send one of those, whatever the received signal is will be contained in one of these disks, and we'll just look at the nearest uh, possible signal in our code, and we'll know it must have come from that. So basically, the idea here is avoiding overlap means eliminating ambiguity. And on the other hand, uh, so here, no overlap means you can unambiguously decode. On the other hand, what does it mean to maximize density? Maximizing the density means cramming as many signals as you possibly can into the space available. So what this is doing is this is maximizing the communication rate. The more possible signals you have available for use in your signal space, uh, the more information you can send. And so from this perspective, the sphere packing problem is exactly the question, at least in this sort of simplified toy model of, in a high dimensional channel, how do you maximize the communication rate without actually creating any ambiguity in decoding? And here, high dimensional channels are really relevant. The thing is that this N has nothing to do with the dimensionality of the physical space we live in. It's just the number of measurements you're making. So for example, cell phones routinely use channels with hundreds of dimensions. So basically, if you want 
to understand uh, cell phones, you've got to think about packing and maybe slightly fancier problems in a several hundred dimensional signal space. So, by the way, before I move on, let me say it's really worth looking up Shannon's 1948 paper. It's called something like, if you just look up, Shan if you type Shannon 1948 into Google, you'll find it. And uh, basically, Shannon developed information theory from scratch, and he wrote it really beautifully. The thing is, he wrote it, first of all, at a time when there were no information theorists, so he had to explain everything from scratch. And secondly, where he really wanted to be accessible to practicing engineers. So it's a really beautiful exposition. And he talks about all sorts of fun things. He'll go on digressions about, for example, crossword puzzles. That uh, two-dimensional crossword puzzles exist. The question is, could we design three-dimensional crossword puzzles? And the answer is no. The entropy of English text isn't suitable for building three-dimensional <laughs> crossword puzzles. And so there are tons of sort of fun things like this. And basically, if you're only going to read one thing in your life about information theory, you should totally look this up online and read it. And then you might want to read more than one thing about information theory, but at least you'll have read this. So any questions about anything so far? Yes? Is there some limit on what the components of R and S can be? So are we really packing not in Rn, but in some subsection of Rn? Exactly. So typically, the signals will be only restricted to a certain amount of space. For example, if you're sending radio signals, it will be limited by the power of your transmitter or something like that. And so... Really, you only get the sphere packing problem in the limit where the sort of error spheres are small in comparison with the volume of space available. Otherwise, you better take the boundary into account. In practice, that tends to be the case, but depending on the particular application, it might or might not be. Yes? Um, is there a version of this where uh, epsilon, like the noise level is not flat, but if the received signal is... Um, like as, as it moves far away from the available signals and not like the probability that it is actually that signal re reduces? Yes. So, uh, so there are some things that you can do just by scaling. So for example, if you want something where the sort of spheres get a little bit smaller as you go farther away, you can probably rescale to normalize that. But then you could have more complicated things where you say, this is a particularly unreliable region of signal space. There's more interference here. The more complicated you make it, the harder your life gets. But yeah, you're totally right that uh, this is just the simplest case. And uh, if you really want to sort of wring the most performance in, out of the real world uh, applications, you're going to want to soup this up. Yes? So, so presumably as you increase the dimension of the, the, the signal, you can yep. transmit more information. Yep. But at the same time, our packings get worse. So is there some optimal dimension to which? Is so, the packing, so the packings get worse. Uh, normalize, the packings get worse. Uh, in terms of density, it turns out the information rate will be, will be a sort of rescaled logarithm of the density. And so that actually converges to a limit as n goes to infinity. So basically, the information rate will be proportional to the dimension in high dimensions. But you're totally right that that's a confusing <coughs> point. So this is assuming that the, that the best density, I mean, if the best density is exponential, yep. which we know it. Yep, we know it has to be exponential, we just don't know the rate. Yep. yep. So are developments in this field currently affecting the rate that my cell phone can download YouTube videos? Or no. So uh, there are two things that, first of all, the sort of biggest obstacle for uh, practical use now is sort of things like souped up noise models that uh, basically, my understanding is in the 70s and 80s that sphere packing was awesome for this. And that, for example, the 24-dimensional packing, the leech lattice, actually got a lot of practical use. On the other hand, uh, 
at the current sort of state of technology, the sort of biggest practical question is uh, making more sophisticated models rather than optimizing the heck out of the simplest ones. So I can't say, so the thing is if somebody made a major advance in high dimensional spear packing, it might be relevant, but a minor advance would totally pale in comparison with the sort of noise modeling issues. Yes? So your S1 and S2 are being sent uh, at the same time? Yep. Um, is there a similar problem for S1 being sent at time t and S2 being sent at time t plus some yeah. like small? So here, what I'm assuming in this model is that everything is synchronized so that you send a signal, you know, get, get received at that time, and there's no sort of interference between times. You can also look at more complicated things where the sender and receiver might not quite be synchronized, things like this, and then it adds an additional layer of complication. Yes? So they're all related to this. There are issues like, for example, these soft potentials that, uh, let me say that they're all in the same sort of general family, but some of them are slight extensions of this. Yes? Yes. In practice, no, because uh, the sort of engineering problems for you know cell phones and things like this don't really involve quantum effects. For quantum computers, yes, and there's a whole sort of theory of quantum error correcting codes. So there are a lot of fascinating quantum questions related to this. On the other hand, right now, the only practical applications seem to be sort of futuristic technology. Yes? It's very closely connected to that. There's a certain sense in which it's the dual problem to that. Yeah. Yes? So when you discretize this to binary information, do you get very different optimal packings? Because you're just on the sort of Hamming cube now? They're surprisingly closely connected. The thing is, this is a sort of, this is, a thing I find difficult to understand, that a priori the discrete world and the continuous world might have nothing to do with each other. In practice, they seem to notice and care about each other. So for example, the 8 and 24 dimensional ver uh, packings here turn out to be sort of liftings to continuous space of certain binary packings and I th Hamming and Golay codes specifically. I find that really weird and my only sort of explanation for that is math is beautiful, but but yeah, they're more closely connected than they sound. I can't quite figure out how, but like the fact that there's this is not static, like you're there's also temporal dimension. Yep. You know, as the signal is coming in, mm -hmm. seems like that's another dimension, another element of the problem that maybe makes it different than just from Exactly, yeah. If you don't assume everything is synchronized, then you have sort of one extra temporal dimension and you've got to worry about sort of packings in time as well as space. Yeah, so uh, let me tell you how to make good packing. Well, let me tell you why there are good packings in high dimensions. So they say that uh, every math talk should include uh, a proof and a joke. Uh, here's the proof. So I'll show you a lower bound for the packing density in high dimensions. In particular, a very simple proof that uh, the density in n dimensions is at least 2 to the minus n. So this is obviously not a sharp bound. If you plug in n equals 1, it tells you you can 
you can fill up at least 50% of one dimension, and we can fill up 100%. So this is not the answer, but it's an answer. So how are we going to do this? So this is going to be a non-constructive proof. I'm going to show you that uh, packings exist with density at least 2 to the minus n. I'm not actually going to tell you one. So I don't want to sort of build this up too much and make it sound intimidating. It'll turn out this will be the sort of forehead slapping duh moment afterwards. But uh, let's see how this works. So uh, let's imagine that you take any so-called saturated packing. So what do I mean by saturated? What I mean is there's no room for more spheres. So in other words, try building a packing where you throw down some spheres. It doesn't matter. Put them wherever you'd like. And then keep on adding spheres. And every time you find a gap big enough to put a sphere in it, put a sphere somewhere in that gap. We don't care where. And keep on going until you run out of gaps. And then you've got a saturated packing. Yes? So one way of looking at it is, so start near the origin, okay? Or wherever your favorite point is, and start filling up gaps there. And the thing is, there's only a sort of bounded amount of room near the origin. So you can only put a certain amount of spheres there before you have to move further away. And so eventually you're going to have to build out from there to infinity, leaving no gaps behind you. That's a good question, though. Is this yes? still all I identical? Yep, exactly. So here we're using identical spheres. Uh, so there are going to be gaps left, just no gaps big enough to fit another sphere. Yep. Is the square packing a better law now? It'll turn out it's not. Uh, I'll say more about that uh, after this proof. But uh, it's a very natural thing to guess. It turns out to be a much worse lower bound for reasons that are kind of weird. But I'll definitely come back to that. Okay, so we've got a saturated packing. I haven't told you what it is. The thing is, there are tons and tons of choices involved as we sort of plop everything down. And it depends on where the gaps are. And I haven't actually given you an example. But hopefully you believe that there exists a saturated packing. So what I claim is every saturated packing, no matter what choices you made along the way, is guaranteed to hit density at least 2 to the minus n. I wonder if I can do a better job of erasing this. How do we define what? Density, exactly. Uh, take a big chunk of space and look at sort of the ratio of volume of spheres in that chunk to volume of whole <coughs> chunk and let the chunk get bigger and bigger. But when you go to like four and five dimensions and yep. three dimensions, what's the volume? How do you define that? Uh, so the question then is sort of how do you measure volumes? Uh, so, I mean, one way to do it is by sort of n-dimensional integrals, say, that the same way you can get the volume of a sphere uh, by doing a sort of two- or three-dimensional integral in two- or three-dimensions, you can compute it in n-dimensions by just doing the same integral with more variables. I know that's not really a very satisfying answer. Oh, that's a good point. Yep. Okay. So, oh yeah, so let's look at the saturated packing. So some of them might be, t that's a terrible picture. Those are all the same size. Some of them might be tangent. They might not. There might be any number of gaps. But what I claim happens is uh, if you double the radius, then you cover space completely. So 
So let's double the radius of all of these. So around each of these centers, I'm going to draw a sphere twice as big. You'll just have to imagine that this figure is accurate. So I made each one twice as big in terms of radius. And so now what's the point? If there were anything that's not covered, any point in space that's not covered by the double radii is uh, at least two radii away from any of the original centers. And that would mean that if it's not covered by the double radii, then it's far enough away that you could have fit another sphere in there. So basically, just from the geometry here, you see that because it's saturated, nothing in space can be two radii away from all of the other centers. And so everything has to be covered when you double the radii. Any questions about this? Yes? Yep, so this is using nothing about the packing except that it's saturated. You can look at the simplest saturated packing you can find, you could look at the most complicated, but all this is using is saturation. There's nothing regular about it, it could be random. Right? Yep, it could be totally random as long as you filled it in enough that there were no holes big enough for another sphere. Yes? In computer science terms, you're saying that any greedy algorithm achieves at least this density, and in physics terms, you're saying that any local optimum under moves Exactly, yeah. So one way of looking at this in computer science terms, like Chris was saying, is as a greedy algorithm, that imagine if you have no sort of overall plan in mind, all you do is start shoving in spheres wherever you can and stop only when you have no more holes. Then that's sort of the greedy approach where you're really sort of short-sighted. All you want to do is add spheres. And it's saying if you do that, you're guaranteed to hit at least 2 to the minus n. So what's the point here? What happens when you double the radius? When you double the radius, you multiply the volume by 2 to the n, because volume scales by the nth power in n dimensions. So you multiplied all the sphere volumes by 2 to the n, and now you're covering space completely. So the conclusion is, when multiplying by 2 to the n covers space completely, you must have covered at least a 2 to the minus n uh, fraction of space before you doubled the radii. Otherwise, you wouldn't have enough sphere material there to cover it completely. <coughs> Any questions about this? How far below the cubic packing density is this bound? It's way above it. <laughs> so the sad thing is, this is very nearly the best thing anyone knows how to do in the high dimensions. And furthermore, this proof was not constructive. It didn't tell you how to find a saturated <coughs> packing. Nobody has ever been able to describe a saturated packing in high dimensions. I should be a little bit careful about how to state this. The thing is, there are sort of generic ways to describe it. One way is you could say, well, just do a greedy algorithm, stuff everything in. And that, you could argue it's a description. It's not a very explicit description. But nobody has ever been able to sort of write down some sort of explicit coordinates that describe a saturated packing in high dimensions. Yes? The cubic packing is not saturated. Let's take a look at that. So uh, let's do that calculation now. So what happens if you try to do a uh, if you try to make uh, a packing uh, just sort of by hand? So for example, you could look at the sort of Zn packing. I don't know how familiar this notation is in physics. Here, z, uh, z is equal to the integers. It's the German word solemn. Uh, and uh, so here, this is sort of an n-dimensional version of the square packing. You're just sort of putting one sphere at every point with integer coordinates. So the layers look like this. So the question is, is this saturated? 
And the answer is no in high dimensions. Let's think about what happens. So first of all, what's the packing radius? So the packing radius here is one half. If you take radius one half, that's just big enough that adjacent points are tangent, adjacent spheres are tangent to each other. But then the question is, how far away can you get from the spheres? So for example, in two dimensions, the holes are here. And if you think about it, in two dimensions, this hole is not nearly big enough to fit another sphere in. So in two dimensions, this packing is saturated. In high dimensions, it's really not. So let's think about this. So what is this hole? So if this is, you know, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, this will be one half, one half. <coughs> and in general, in n dimensions, we're going to make a hole at exactly the same place. There's a hole uh, in this packing in the middle of each cell where all the coordinates are one half. So now the question is, how far is this from the packing? So if we want to know how far away this is from integer points, well, we can just use the distance formula. We take the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences in each coordinate, and you're at least one half away in every coordinate. And so this is the square root of n over 2. So uh, what happens is the center of the cell in high dimensions is really ridiculously far away from the corners. This is the thing I find really crazy, that in two dimensions you look at the square packing and you think, ah, uh, you know, that's a kind of stupid packing, the layers aren't nestled together, but it's not that bad. On the other hand, if you take, you know, n equals a million, in a million dimensions, the square root of a million over 2 is 500. So in a million dimensions, you've got these holes that are 500 units away from any sphere uh, that you've got in your packing. And that is totally crazy. This sort of hypercubic packing here has got these gaping holes that you can fit, you know, vast numbers of spheres into. So it's not only not saturated, it's not even close to saturated when n is large. So basically, this is going to be not saturated when this is greater than 1. The thing is, when this is greater than 1, it gives you enough room to put in uh, an, additional, uh, an additional sphere into the holes. And this is greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1. In other words, when n is greater than or equal to 4. So basically, the square lattice is saturated, the cubic lattice is saturated. Already in four dimensions, this is not saturated. And in five dimensions, it's not even close to saturated. And in a million dimensions, it's ridiculously far from being saturated. Yes? I'm a little confused. What's wrong with the logic of the volume of the individual sphere is due to, yep. it's due to the n, due to the minus n mm -hmm. times some factor. Yep. And that factor seems to grow with that. Oh, that factor and action. Then, huh? uh, and then I divide, then it looks like it is this volume. Uh, let's calculate this. The factor actually shrinks with n. So the question is, uh, what's uh, the volume of a sphere yeah. of radius r? Uh, in n dimensions. So 
My favorite way to write it is as pi to the n over 2 over n over 2 factorial times r to the n. Here you have to worry what is 1 half factorial, it's the gamma function. Uh, but the point is that as n goes to infinity, the factorial in the denominator takes over and really ruins everything. Exactly. So basically, if you look at uh, the Zn packing, what it gives is uh, density pi to the n over 2 over n over 2 factorial times 1 over 2 to the n. And the n over 2 factorial, it goes to 0 way faster than any exponential. Yes? Yep. In terms of, wait, I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh, I thought it was just a statement, right? I mean, oh. like, you know, hypersphere, there's going to be like a lot of volume, like, you know, near the boundary, and things, right? Like, if yes. Yep. Does that also hold for like even classes, or do you think about how? Okay, let's look at squares versus cubes. I think that this, let me try to take, I think, your point and uh, make it to the class as a whole. So let's uh, think about how this works. So, what does a cube look like in n dimensions? So, I've told you that spheres aren't that good at packing in high dimensions. Cubes are great at packing in, n dim in any dimension. So, what happens if we have an n-dimensional cube? Okay, I've drawn a one-dimensional cube, but whatever. I've drawn a three-dimensional cube. I can't even count. But it's going to be n-dimensional. So what are the number of vertices? We know to get a cube, the number of vertices doubles from the previous dimension. A cube is sort of two squares sitting above each other. One is sitting above the other. A hypercube is a cube sitting above a cube. In general, you're going to have two to the n vertices. And if you've got edge length one, exactly the same calculation as we just did there shows the diagonal length is square root of n. So if you think about a cube in high dimensions, a cube looks really crazy. The thing is, if you think about this with n equals a million, say, two to the millionth power vertices is some ludicrous, insane number of vertices. And diagonal length square root of a million is a thousand. So basically, a unit cube in a million dimensions has some insane number of vertices and an unbelievably long diagonal. So let me draw a picture of a million dimensional cube. It looks something like this, only with a lot more vertices. That you think of the cube being a very small thing, but it sticks out really far in high dimensions and in a ridiculous number of directions. On the other hand, the reason this is a misleading picture is the cube is also convex, whereas what I've drawn here is not even remotely convex. But somehow, in a million dimensions, you have enough room for two to the millionth vertices to stick out, I guess they're sticking out half of this amount, so 500 units in all sorts of directions while still preserving convexity. So what's the point here? The thing is, if you think about this in terms of comparing a packing with, with spheres versus cubes, the thing is, spheres by definition don't stick out in any direction. They go the same distance everywhere. So the reason why cubes are so great at packing is that all these sort of deep holes here that are ridiculously far away from the grid the cubes have vertices that stick out. So if you imagine a sort of cube packing in high dimensions, this is not a technical term, but I like to imagine that the cubes have a lot of fingers, and the fingers sort of stick into the gaps and sort of neatly fill up all the space, just sort of perfectly coming together so that you get density one. But basically, if you want to pack in high dimensions, it works best if you've got a lot of fingers to fill in the holes, and that's the one thing spheres don't have. Yes? If I had an algorithm that guaranteed uh, production of jumps field packing, 
So, okay, so what do we know about lower bounds in terms of, for example, jammed packings? We don't know very much. So, uh, Yeah, so that's totally reasonable, and the answer is uh, nobody knows. So first of all, nobody even knows whether this bound is sharp for the worst saturated packing. Well, it's not, so let me tell you a few facts and uh, a lot of ignorance. So it turns out the best we know in high dimensions is only very slightly better than this bound. So first of all, you can improve this argument just a little bit. The thing is that uh, here we said that when you multiply the volume by 2 to the n, you better cover space completely. On the other hand, above one dimension, you can't possibly cover it without overlap. So you could ask, okay, if I think about the best covering with spheres, how much overlap does there have to be? And you can get a slightly better bound. You can get some constant, I don't even remember what the constant is, let's call it c, times n times 2 to the minus n in n dimensions. So you can increase this by a factor of n. And on the one hand, that's great. That's making it a million times denser in a million dimensions. On the other hand, on an exponential scale, a factor of n is fairly wimpy. So a mathematician named Keith Ball in 1992 found a different argument that gave 2 times n minus 1 times 2 to the minus n. So this is not sharp in low dimensions. But for many years, this was the best bound, the best construction known in high dimensions. And again, this is not explicit. He proved existence, but he didn't give an explicit example. Incidentally, Keith is one of the two people in this area whose name I'm most envious of. Uh, the other one was Marcel Best, who discovered the best packing in 10 dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so my student, Stephanie Vance, uh, improved this in 2011. What she got is, in sufficiently high dimensions, she got a factor of 6 over e times n times 2 to the minus n, when n is a multiple of 4. So e is less than 3, so 6 over e is greater than 2. So she improved this asymptotically by a 3 over e factor, which is even smaller than a linear factor but, well, it was the first improvement in 19 years. And Akshay Venkatesh improved this still further in 2013. He got a really great improvement. He got an extra factor of log log n, which was the first super linear improvement here. I'm not actually being sarcastic when I say it was great. For a certain sparse sequence of dimensions n, so at this point, we are sort of struggling to get log log n factors, which are three exponentials worse than the 2 to the minus n. And uh, we don't even know if this works in all high dimensions. So basically, we've got real ignorance here. So why does Akshay get a sparse sequence of dimensions and Stephanie get multiples of four? What they're doing is they're adding extra structure here. They're not just looking for packings, they're looking for packings with special symmetry groups that force them to be denser. On the other hand, I think that that's a, uh, I think that that's not the right approach. Adding more structure makes things easier to analyze, but it really costs you a lot too. But basically, I'm going to fill this area with question marks because we don't understand what's going on here. And this is an area that I really think needs more work. 
The thing is, there was a 20-year period with no improvements. But if you look up Stephanie and Akshay's papers, they're actually fairly simple. If there's enough time, I'll simply tell you how they work tomorrow. But these are not complicated arguments. And uh, what happens is, I believe that we're sort of stuck for lack of ideas. And there are any number of things that you could hope for. So for example, you had the suggestion about, you know, what happens if we don't just say it's saturated? What if we want a packing that's jammed so everything's rigidly locked into place, maybe except for a few rattlers? What happens if uh, you uh, look at various sorts of compression algorithms? Can you analyze them? That basically our current understanding of packings in high dimensions is more or less pure ignorance, where the only actual arguments we really have are ones saying, you know, well, you know, if we sort of analyze something generic or random with some simple property, we can prove this. So in the best of all possible worlds, we would get uh, a mathematical proof. On the other hand, I would be really excited even by things that fall far short of proof. If you can give a heuristic argument for why jammed packings in high dimensions should behave in a certain way, if you can do very detailed numerics and extrapolate and try to at least numerically predict facts about high dimensional density, basically anything that can shed light on this I think would be really interesting. Anyway, we're out of time for today, but tomorrow I'll tell you a little bit more about where packing has come from. In particular, I'll tell you about where the eight-dimensional uh, packing comes from, a little bit about why it's optimal, and a little bit more about what people do in high dimensions. But in any case, I'll be around here today and tomorrow, so feel free to bug me with questions and stuff in between.